Welcome to Finding Success Podcast. I'm Antti Pietilä, and in this episode, we'll explore how to build a 100 million sales pipeline with Virta Global's uh, Director of Digital Sales and Marketing, Samuli Ahola. Welcome to the show, Samuli. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, Samuli, uh, Virta is a EV charging platform company, basically, software company mostly, but also hardware. You supply also hardware. Yes, that is correct. So basically, uh, by DNA, we are a platform company and we provide software which helps uh, helps you to control your business when you are running EV charging business or offering that as a service to your own customers or visitors or clients. And uh, at the moment, we also work as a one-stop shop meaning that you can also get the hardware and the software from the same place because for the customer that is usually the easier way but by dna software and platform company and in this episode we'll uncover this your journey from let's say 600,000 sales pipeline to 100 million uh, sales pipeline uh, but let's first dig into what what is virtas business where are you, you are actually <laughs> like you are all says with the global <laughs> yeah yeah in a you know especially in finland a lot of people uh think that virta is operating on a smaller geographical area than what we actually are so at the moment we have offices in helsinki stockholm london berlin singapore and paris so most of our clients are from the european union area but we also have some business going on in asia as well as we speak And um, yeah, by by DNA, what we actually do, uh, let's put it this way, that if you are a company that uh, is either interested in making EV charging actually a future revenue stream, or you have clients or visitors that uh, you are actually parking to your locations, you want to offer them EV, char EV charging as a service to, you know, make your customers happier, they are actually requesting it, or maybe they stay longer in your premises or in your retail stores when you actually are able to offer this, but you're not going to build your own team in the company that would actually, you know, work 24-7 around EV charging, then we basically step in that, hey, we can actually help you, you don't need to worry about this, you focus on your core business and we run this whole. Uh, that may seem simple, uh, service or business stream that that when when you think about ev charging but actually there's a lot of complicated factors included in it and some special points uh you need uh, local representatives because you're you you have to connect to the hardware side yeah. of it you supply the hardware side as, as well um so that's one thing and The other thing is you're basically targeting four different uh, segments. Yeah, you could say so, or maybe think about by, that. By profiles. Yeah, profiles, or and that's also something that what we see in a young industry like ours, uh, certain verticals uh, might not be there in 2022, but in 2024, they're all of a sudden one of the most important ones to us. Yeah. So that landscape changes constantly. and. And uh, when we move forward, especially when it comes to sort of this, like, uh, uh, if you, for example, European wide also legislation drives different verticals to start considering EV charging and how that is going to impact their own business. So legislation is also a strong force in Europe that actually sort of uh, drives customers towards us. And we might see that in 2025, all of a sudden there is a new vertical that EV charging is incredibly relevant for them, even yeah. though it's not like that at the moment. You have to educate the customers like, like let's say in any uh, tech business basically, yes. that you're kind of, they need to know how to run the EV, EV yes. let's say EV side business, side hustle, is yeah. ba ma basically side hustle for them. Yes, for the majority, yes. Yeah, yeah, that is that is correct. And uh, also, uh, what is interesting is that not as much anymore. But if we go back a couple of years, if we think about like the way that people were, uh, you know, contacting us, yeah. usually they already had an idea of how and what they are going to do. Maybe they have even already bought some hardware, which was 
completely incompatible with their actual plans, what they were trying to achieve. Yeah. So a lot of times it's it's about uh, those discussions. Are, they have a lot to do with educa educational stuff, but also that, especially in Finland, people also very often want to buy the cheapest available hardware and then start figuring out like, hey, actually, what what is that? What is the actual goal that we're trying to achieve with this? Yeah. Now we have these Chinese boxes. Our storage is full of them, but we never thought about that. You know, how are we actually going to operate them or make money with them? Or is there something that we could do this in a way smarter way? When we th think about stuff like, you know, energy load management, uh, dynamic load management, all kinds of things that actually have to do with the electrical grid. And at the end of the day best result for them might have been that, you know, they would have actually been able to run a much larger stack or network of chargers if they had thought about the energy things beforehand, which, for example, our software enables them to do. A good example is the local um, mall Hertzi mm. down the road. I don't know if it's your customer or not. Probably not. I think it's plug uh, plugins uh, customer <laughs> having a mall uh, where you have um, four kilowatt charges is, right. is I mean, yeah. brain dead. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. That is a, that is exactly like you. You, 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 you have might. to be there something like ten hours to charge your car. Exactly, exactly. That's not probably gonna increase your customer happiness that much. No, they're usually empty. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, all the other reason. parking places are taken. So yeah, yeah. That's that's the case, and that's a that's a brilliant example. That if uh, I don't know about their specific case, but. Uh, just the way that you describe it is that, you know, some people or companies might jump into making purchase decisions with price and hardware first without thinking about the actual use case and what are we trying to achieve with this. Is this a business stream or is this something that is actually going to increase customer loyalty? Or is this something that if we do this in a non-smart way, it's actually going to work to the opposite direction? And this is your again, happiness hasn't clearly yeah. increased because of that. <laughs> and as an example, your business is similar to any other tech business again, yeah. where customers uh, buy services, train probably services before they actually buy a piece of software. Yeah, and and um, those can be totally incompatible with what they are planning to actually exactly. uh, what they end up, end up uh, buying so marketing wise you you have to educate but you, you also be need, need to be a little bit tricky how to, how do you communicate with them as they have already made a wrong from these investments that is that is also true and i think now we're talking about this a trend that we see also when when talking about product information in general that the traditional way is that you know you talk about features and different technical subjects and then some may may actually make their purchase decision based on those but then when you actually think about what are you trying to achieve what is the value that this can provide to you and turn it that way around things start making much more sense and uh, i think this is also the you know a little bit of the dilemma of when we think about the whether it's marketing or product information or even selling uh, there are some traditional ways of doing things that might not be the best way to help the customer nowadays but if we go to the situation when it, uh, how it was when you joined and mm. where you are now so uh, first you were at that time around what was what was the year? Uh, I joined the company 2019. 2019, you were at something like five six million uh, euro company at, yeah. at that at that moment, and you are now a hundred million. Yeah, I don't know what's our final revenue number for from from last year, but uh, if everything goes according to plan, this year we're gonna break 100 million. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit before we because uh, that. Or as a first question, uh, what is the competitive landscape? I mean, what things are competing in the minds of, of, of a customer from their attention? So uh, usually the, the most tr uh, tricky part is to get their attention yes. in the first place. And, and uh, the competition not, is not necessarily other EV charger mm. platform providers, but some other things as well. Right. Right. Yeah, I think uh, overall, uh, if we think about, basically, if we think about the 
classical example that most of the CRMs are not necessarily competing against other CRMs, they're competing against Excels. Yeah. And uh, I think if we go back to 2019, th it was still, back then it was a relevant question that is EV charging actually going to be something that's going to be happening? Is it something that, you know, that the transportation is actually going electric? At that point, that was a really the relevant question that the customers were debating about. Nowadays, when we look at it, it's not really a question anymore. Like earlier, I mentioned the legislation and how that already in, in Europe, especially, is, is really, really pushing strongly towards new regulations that you know, we need to decrease the pollution numbers and traffic needs to be more electric. And there's also a requirement for infrastructure that needs to be built in the EU, uh, EU territory. So I think like back in that day, we were still sort of preachers about how the world is going to look yeah. like when we move forward. Nowadays, it's more about uh, is this going to be a business stream or is this going to be an additional service? that we offer to our customers. And I think that's mainly the question what we're facing nowadays, that uh, even if you pick uh, companies from the very same vertical, for some, it is definitely something that they actually see it as a business stream, as an opportunity that's going to be a part of their portfolio when moving forward, that this is actually going to be something that eventually we will make money out of this. Then there are, you know, companies that uh, view it more as not not as a necessary evil, but more as some as, as of something that we want to do this with a low cost because we don't expect this to be an actual business. It's just going to be an additional service for uh, our clients that they are going to be a little bit happier, but we don't expect necessarily this to be profitable for our yeah. own perspective. And uh, if you look at the competitive landscape, you have uh, some providers out there that actually are willing to fund the whole operation as, as long as you give them a piece of land and they're going to keep all that money as well. Yeah. So, you know, that the competitive landscape is it, it's transforming all the time. And uh, we also are seeing a pretty strict price competition at the moment because what, what we see at the moment is a lot of um, EV charging startups booming and coming up, all with a little bit of different angles, but uh, a lot of them are actually playing pure, pure gambling when it comes to if they actually are going to exist in five years or not. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of risky, risk players out there at the moment. And uh, recently we also saw one of the biggest uh, EV companies or EV charging companies in the world, ChargePoint, and they had huge layoffs and I think they needed to uh, let go like half of their sea level recently. Yeah. So even the biggest biggest players are now actually seeing the situation that if there's been a, some gambling beforehand, now the actual real world is starting to kick in. Yeah, and I can I can easily see that there are, there's ton of places where they have invested on the let's say uh, first generation charges which right. are uh, just inadequate. Yeah, for yeah, the, exactly. for those needs. So I I really don't understand why they put those 11 or 22 kilowatt hour uh, charges in, in shopping malls, right. for, uh, right. for, for example, where you need uh, many, many hours to actually charge it. Exactly. It's just, again. It doesn't make sense. And from the customer's sense. perspective, they'd be probably more than happy to pay a few euros to get the, just the faster charger there. Yeah. That would be no issue at all. But uh, again, these, there are very different perspectives on how how companies and people view EV charging nowadays that if you even if you don't think about it from the business perspective but you at least think about it from the client's perspective yeah and that already already changes changes it a little bit but again uh, sales wise at that uh, 2011 uh, 2019 uh, you really didn't have a digital sales uh, Function or, or no, no. I, when I joined the company, I was sort of like the lone expert at, with the title of head of digital sales uh, at the end of 2019. And then I was, well, basically, previously when I was working for the marketing agency at Advanced B2B, I used to work for, I had been preaching to, I don't know, 20, 25 different companies for the past three years about how sales and marketing should be working together. And uh, then when I, when I joined Virta, uh, I could see pretty clearly that there there are good things being done on the marketing side of things and uh, 
for example, the ideology of what the website should be doing and how it could work as a lead generation engine. All those were in place, but these two different teams were not aligned or working together or working towards the same KPIs. That was pretty much the situation. And uh, I still remember my uh, first visit to visit our UK team back then. I think it was probably December 2019. And uh, the first thing I did was that our geo director explained me how all his sales cases are in his outlook. Okay. And we started going through that. Okay, mm. good. You have sales cases in outlook. Perhaps we should put this somewhere where others can see them as well. Yeah. So I think that was a pretty, pretty descriptive starting point. Uh, that's <laughs> quite useful. So <laughs> you might be having a CRM, but not necessarily everybody's using right. it. Right. Right. And, and um, I think one of the key things is to uh, establish um, the KPIs, the, the common metrics of what is a lead, what is a uh, sales yes. qualified lead, and so forth. And, and you, you can start measuring how many of of we are getting and and, yeah. and uh the best case is that you you know how uh, how much they are costing and how much money you're making right. out of it uh because that opens uh, the door towards uh the possibility to get let's say rid of marketing budget right. and, and move to the where where when we are making money out of it, we'll invest more. Right, right. Yeah, and I, and I think overall, uh, if there would be a number one thing to mention that, uh, in my mind, w if you start building this type of function, what needs to be in place and what is the number one priority to make sure that it works, it is the overall process. It, it, it's clearly, you know, you can do very good things on the marketing and digital side of things, but if the process fails at some point with sales, no one can actually see the results. Yeah. And that was also, uh, if we think about, go back to 2019, 2020, I started working there uh, sort of like in between, on trying to understand to my best knowledge, like how this actually goes, like what is the, what is the actual process of things, how they move forward, and uh, what does the sales process look like, and uh, if they're, you if we're starting to actually build this process with the digital sales and marketing, how the handover should be. And uh, I think like the progression, how we went from there was that then we started to establish common rules on how the leads are passed forward. What is the criteria for them? What's, how, how are we, how are we working from there? And I spent a lot of time educating the existing sales team about how, you know, when you get this type of notification, this is what it means. Please take this action and let's see what follows. And very soon after that, I noticed that when the salespeople had this 360 sales role that they were, you know, doing all everything from prospecting to handling existing customers, then the actual engagement with prospective leads, if the engagement even was there, it was one poorly written email at maximum. That was the engagement level. So then from there, half a year later, uh, we started coming up with the idea that what if we were actually have a team that their full day job is to focus on the engagement part of these leads and then reach out to new clients, prospective clients that we identify as being relevant. And uh, from there, at the end of 2020, uh, we formed the sales development team to actually be this glue between yeah. the engagement part of, of the early stages of the sales process. And uh, I think overall, uh, that was absolute necessity in order to get things to the place where they are right now. Because it's, it's understandable why if your table is already full of stuff as a salesperson, existing customers are calling you. If you get this one lead, the one email is probably the maximum that you're going to send back to them. But then if we look at, I think it was uh, Outreach's study that they published a couple of years ago, that on an average it takes seven interactions to actually engage someone. Mm -hmm. So then you can pretty much do the math that there's a lot that we could do in the process for the engagement part if we are now only sending one poorly written email compared to the situation that you actually have a team of people whose job is to engage. Yeah, and if, if you think about sales, uh, salesman, salesperson who needs to do the whole process, right. it's really difficult to manage the whole process from... Uh, cold calling right. uh, to the closing. And in your case, uh, the salespeople need to travel to, to the location perhaps. Right. 
So there's traveling also associated. So it's really difficult to manage uh, your time. Yeah, yeah. And, and the balance of, of those different activities uh, so that uh, you close deals and you create new, new, um, new leads in, right. in the beginning and, and so forth. So dividing it that so that you have a SDR team who is actually doing the beginning of the sales right. process uh, stuff, and then you have the sales executives can concentrate on on the sales process side right, of it, like the later part of the yeah. of the actual process. That is that is exactly how it qualified is. leads uh, where you can actually survey they, they dis discover they uh, um, what is the best solution for them right. and negotiate and and uh, survey the this uh, place where they want to put the uh, yeah. charges and and so forth make offers and negotiate prices and so forth exactly exactly and, and i guess like if you put it that way one of the most important functions of the sales development team is to uh, maximize and optimize the sales team to spend their time where it actually matters. Yeah. Uh, you have done it for a couple of years now. Have you seen uh, as, a, as the SDR as a function that can be used as a, uh, let's say, uh, training for becoming a sales executive? Yes, it definitely can. However, it, it's not going to happen by itself. Yeah. It's something that needs to be structured in the company. And then it very much depends on what are the next roles that the company can offer yeah. at that point. A leap from sales development role to an actual software sales executive or account execu executive role, is a, that's a, quite of a leap. And not everyone is able to take that leap, despite the fact that they could be one of the best performers in the SDR team. So I think if the company has an inside sales function, for example, yeah. that could be very logical next step from the SDR yeah. to move forward. But again, uh, a complex product like yours, uh, training a new salesperson mm. is not an easy job. No. Whereas something like SDR where you don't need to that long a training, but right. you do a high volume, so you kind of learn the basics well, then it's a good step to right. move forward. Right. Exactly, exactly. That's how, that's how it is. And then also, I think it's it's a, uh, something that very much depends on how closely the sales developers actually work with the uh, account executives, because yeah. they can learn tons already while working as an SDR, if that connection yeah. is there. What about feeding the funnel? I mean, uh, in the beginning, uh, you were probably doing quite much outreach. Yeah, I think like uh, overall, when we think about back in those days, we didn't really have a team that was doing the outreach. Or do you mean like the beginning of the sales development team? I mean, the beginning of 2019. 2019. 2019. Yeah, I think overall, uh, if we think about that situation, I think it was salespeople in 360 role, no one having actual time for prospecting, Yeah. no structured process around it no metrics to follow if that is actually happening or not. And uh, I think overall it was uh, probably way less structured process overall than what yeah. it is nowadays. But the, the, the process of, of getting new leads right. were mostly uh, outbound? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think. And, and also through channel, we already back then operated with a lot of resellers. Yeah. And yeah. I think that was that was one of the things that we were doing. But also, yeah, there was outreach definitely happening as well. And uh, obviously, at that time, we didn't really have the motion going on in a way that we would have a funnel that feeds the salespeople the way it does yeah. nowadays. Uh, if we move to, let's say, end of End of last year or, or mm. uh, early this year, uh, where are your leads coming now? Are they coming with the marketing-driven operation outbound? Basically, uh, I think company-wide split most, if, uh, if I think about the most recent numbers, company-wide sl split is that 40% of the pipeline overall comes through digital channels nowadays, either digital marketing or SDRs. And if we look at the new, just purely new customers, then the split is something like 45-55. Company-wide. 45 is coming through the... Digital. Um, uh, and the SDR is... Yeah, they're, they're allocated within the digital. Yeah, but um, the SDR is mostly outbound operation. 
very much depends on the geo. In some geos we have the lucky situation that their daily task is already filled with inbound leads and taking the meetings that okay, are actually okay, relevant yeah, from yeah. there. But that's not the situation in all the geos. Oh, but so, if, if, if you, what is the, the split between inbound and outbound? Um, if we think about purely new customers and uh, inbound portion of that, if I'm going to go and say company-wide 25-30% are purely inbound leads, that convert to being actual pipeline later on, that would probably be yeah. the split. And then the SDR outbound work on top of that would result into the roughly 45% of the overall new customer. Yeah, pipeline. and the rest is coming from, through channels and... Yeah, sales executives themselves, one way or the other. Yeah, uh, referrals. But, uh, yeah, yeah, referrals kind of... and, you know, basic ground sales work. Oh, yeah, yeah, driving... Around the motorway and seeing a, sl uh, a slot there, and yeah. uh, okay, I, I'll call that guy yeah, there. Yeah, so, yeah, the usual. Yeah, uh, uh, I let it unstructured uh, outbound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's of course something that's happening. Perhaps you have a, a real estate investors. Mm. They buy charges to one location, then you sell to to their other location. It's it might be a new customer for you, but there is a con connection. Connection, anyway. yeah. Connection, same board members or same uh, right. executives or whatever it might be. So, if we focus on the inbound side, uh, what are the ways for you to fill the channel? Paid ads, um, search, uh, social. I would say that uh, from day one, since I joined the company, and probably even before that, we had co considered. Uh, that our website is it needs to be the number one trap katiska in finnish yeah that uh, you know we have this one hub that whenever we get people to land there that is actually where the magic happens so uh, we've been focused focusing a lot on uh, creating content for organic traffic thinking about this basic you know top of the funnel middle yeah. of the funnel bottom of the funnel type of things and uh, then after that when we actually sort of got the machine working in English, then it was time to translate it because we, we operate in different markets nowadays. We have at least uh, language versions of English, English, German, French, Swedish, Finnish, at least those. So then sort of when we found the pattern that works, it was time to, uh, as soon as we had the local sales team in there, then we wanted to act obviously translate the best bits that work and then from the promotion side of things uh, we have tried to build as much of an automated machine as possible when it comes to paid advertising that uh, whenever we have uh, without having to discuss with the salespeople we want to ensure that whenever there is a sales case in the pipeline certain advertising cadences automatically trigger then and then uh, the prospective client would see our best performing content for that specific customer segment throughout the buying process, depending on which part of the buying process they are in. And um, there we utilize paid social. Uh, Google Ads is pretty big for us in terms yeah. of... Yeah, retargeting. Yeah, retargeting, uh, that's a tricky one. Uh, it's It has produced results in some cases previously. However, when uh, it depends on the network, how accurate you can be regarding the retargeting, that are you actually spending budget on the companies that are good fits for you, or are yeah. you able to, you know, specify it accurately enough for that purpose? Because also you can spend tons of money on retargeting for random visitors just looking for information out of pure interest. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, and, and in B to B, the segments are quickly so small that you, yeah. you, you cannot target them yeah, anymore. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes we do this a bit of manual uh, side of retargeting as well, that whenever they get, we know that, you know, these customers have visited our website, have been interested about us, we are interested about them. Audiences are not big enough to do the actual automated retargeting. Perhaps we launch a LinkedIn campaign only for their directors. Yeah. So basically, the one thing that I'm seeing a lot is that companies are not willing to spend uh, money on... Um, or are reluctant to uh, invest into content marketing, mm. especially uh, search-based, 
because they think that the rewards are so far away mm. and uh, they are difficult to estimate and the search volumes are not there. It's e difficult to see that, okay, there are 300 searches globally for this keyword right. <laughs> happening and, and so forth. So uh, I assume that there isn't too much search traffic either in, in your segment as well. So how, how, um, how uh, did you I don't have the exa that? exact numbers, but overall, uh, since day one, SEO has been one of our you know, long-term strategies when it comes to marketing. We, we want to be the kings of the hill when it comes to yeah. our industry in SEO. Uh, in some markets, we are actually doing that quite nicely. Right now, in some markets, there's much more competition and then we need to boost our game and and make sure that uh, that happens eventually. But uh, I think if going back to what you mentioned earlier, that uh, a lot of times when people, you know, jump into the, especially startups, realize that we are, we have a product that should be uh, found easily from Google, their idea of the investment is that I'm going to hire a one young person who's Vi really visible in social media and they can probably do this overnight and we're going to be number one in Google. Mm -hmm. I've also been in a company where I was approached by a C-level member saying that they know a guy who can be get us to be number one in Google. And uh, some people actually still believe that that can be doable by one person overnight. Yeah, uh, it, it is actually much, much, so, much more than uh, what, that. What's the reality? <laughs> reality is that it's a long term strategy and you build the foundation and uh, it's it's sort of Playing the game of SEO is sort of like uh, if you know the castle that or or I don't know if it's a temple or what's the right word church that they're building in Barcelona. Yeah, they've been building it for I don't know how many years, but it's still I, I think if now there's at least a date when it's going to be ready. A couple of hundred years, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and it's playing the game of SEO, especially in speci uh, several different markets. It's kind of like that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, even if you're not number one in that market, but you're constantly building your way through there, then it's going to be a cumulative process yeah. in terms of what you actually get out of it. And uh, I think overall, it's it's something that uh, you need to be uh, sort of on top of things because Google's algorithm changes. Uh, the old SEO tricks and hacks are no longer relevant. Now we see AI coming up. That's definitely going to have an impact mm -hmm. on the way that Google ranks pages and so forth. So uh, it's it's something that you need to be on top of things technologically as well. You need to understand and try to understand as best as you can your ideal customer. What could be the things that they are looking for. Also do a bit of research on how that actually yeah. works. But at the end of the day, Google wants good content to be on top of the listing. You can go as deep technologically as you want to, but if you actually release a good piece of content that outside uh, external sources refer to that content, yeah. that's, that's going to get you gradually higher and higher up on that uh, billboard. And uh, also some things that people don't always necessarily, especially if they're, they have only been doing SEO for a short period of time is that when you actually target the high intent long tail keywords, mm -hmm. that's where the purchase decision lies. Yeah. And uh, then having the logic that, you know, if you can actually win the game on those keywords with your best performing bottom of the funnel type of content, you're actually probably looking for quicker wins than what you would ac uh, otherwise get from playing the SEO game. Yeah. That, um Talking about targeting, the, where should you target the funnel? Of course, mm. you should, need, uh, should target, um, if possible, the bottom end. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, the farther you go, the longer you need to educate them. That is true. And, and the more you will lose during the journey. So if there are enough customers, you don't need many, yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> because such a high percent percentage will convert. Right. Um, that's, again, something that if you start to build the funnel, you probably, it's a good idea to start quite close to the product. Yeah. And then yeah. I progress mean, further. And, further. And, and also, if, if thinking about an individual piece of content, if you have, you know, limited resources and you can produce four pieces of content in 2024, make sure that all of those are case studies from existing customers. Yeah, easily the best performing piece of content and most usable in sales, marketing, advertisement, 
you name it. But again, you probably have some angle how to do those, because what I'm seeing is that uh, oftentimes you are producing case studies that uh, are quite the same, yeah. meaning that there's no different angle. Right. Like if you talk with a journalist, they never do interviews with the same format. They, right. they always have an angle and then use a format. Right, right. It. Yeah, I think overall the main thing, if you think about case studies, at least in my ideal thinking, uh, we would have few relevant case studies for each segment and each territory that yeah. we're in. Because, uh, like you mentioned, a journalist would not sort of write the same same piece or same type of piece over and over again. But uh, what is the relevance for a real estate player for this case study that was actually about the gas station? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's one thing. That's sort of but the, for example, for real estate, you cannot do all the uh, all the case studies for that in, right. in the same format. So right. you kind of have at least headline level. You need to uh, select the angle. Yeah. Okay. For for this case, we'll need to talk about the the uh, let's say business side of right. things. For right. this, we need to discuss about the um, the problems of uh, right. installing it or whatever it might be. Right. So yeah. Kind, and, kind and of I, have for different uh, objections or different. Yes. Uh, and, and also when it comes to, you know, basic sales methodology, medic, when you think about yeah. it, metrics is there one of the really uh, highlighted keywords. And at the end of the day, when you think about like, how does the prospective customer measure success? Yeah. And the better you can actually address that in terms of numbers, data, the story itself mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. case studies, mm -hmm. the better impact it's going to have on the prospective customer. Yeah. But getting back to the SEO uh, thing, uh, as we're talking about, let's say, you, your story right. here, uh, how long did it take to see actual results? You're still fighting the battle in number of different markets, right. different languages. And uh, obviously you are also having uh, problems of targeting the right audience because mm. in either judging there's a ton of consumers searching that topic, there right. are journalists searching that topic, see, uh, there are EV owners searching the topics and uh, uh, apartment buildings, which right. are not necessarily your uh, business are also searching the topic. Yep. So there's a lot of, let's say, non-customers also doing the search. So yes, how, so how did you find the keywords that are relevant just for you? Well, I think um, there are a lot of tools that help you to do that. And then by testing, you kind of uh, start to understand if there are patterns, if you keep an eye on, you know, what type of conversions we are getting and where they are coming from yeah. in terms of that. I think a good example is that uh, for a long time, we saw that based on data, uh, our by far best performing piece of content was an ebook called How to Build a Business from EV Charging. Then uh, a couple of years later, when we revisited the topic, we had been promoting that content on, you know, different pop-ups, different yeah. conversion points throughout the website, because we saw that it's actually performing well, people like to download it. And then when we actually uh, started to analyze the discussions that the SDRs have had with the, you know, especially in UK more than anywhere else, that, that what they had the dis uh, what type of discussions they had with the prospective customers after that conversion, they were, uh, for a large part, they were people that were thinking about building a startup around EV charging. Okay, so they were so, non-customers. So they were yeah. actually someone that if things go well for them, they could be our customer in a couple of years. But at the moment, not relevant. Waste of time, yeah. waste of money. So these type of things you actually just learn along the way and you need to be on top of your own metrics that you're not becoming blind to the fact that like, hey, this ebook is being downloaded, you know, more than any other. That's great, but actually go a bit deeper and analyze the actual impact on the cases yeah. that land yeah. into your pipeline. And what is what are the, you know, common nominators in in, uh, in, in these cases that actually derive from this specific ebook. Maybe it's a certain vertical, maybe it's a certain problem yeah. that you're looking for. And uh, also also one of the V2G was a really, really hot topic. It still is, but a couple of years ago, it was something that the whole industry was talking about. And uh, we, we created a lot of SEO friendly material for that, 
reach number one in Google in several, several countries. But the problem with that is also that no one actually knows when it comes to the customers that what to do with V2G still today. It's something uh, vehicle to grid is yeah. what's shortened from basically the ideology that while your car is plugged to the EV charger, uh, the power can go both ways. So yeah. your car can be used as a battery. And that was all obviously something that was super interesting. But nowadays, if we look at the conversions that we get from there, uh, usually the type of conversions we get is that either we are looking to, you know, launch a project around this in 2025 or something. It's something more of a research yeah. experiment type of project or it's uh, individual people that actually want to build like a smart electric system into their own homes. Yeah. And again, it's uh, it's a trend. Trends right. are, are uh, good to surf, uh, surf from. Right. But uh, they might not actually serve the business at least on the short term. Right, right. And, and that's also, you know, you need to, SEO cannot be a separate game you play. Yeah. It actually needs to be the part of whatever you are doing in sales and marketing, hopefully jointly. SEO is one of the tools that you use to serve the same group of customers that you would otherwise also want in your funnel. Yeah, and, and, and they, let's say, you have to measure the quality of the leads yes. uh, by the sales. Yes. And in some cases, you might be uh, getting a ton of uh, not so quality leads, but there might be some gold nuggets right. within that uh, right. volume. And in some cases, you get um, quite a good quality leads only from right. that uh, uh, ebook or whatever it might be. So uh, again, it, the percentage doesn't matter, but right. the end result, how many, how, uh, how, how many nuggets did you exactly. get out of it? Exactly. That's, uh, that's very, very, very correct. And that also comes back to the overall ideology that w whenever you have a sales and marketing functions, if you want them to work together, put the same KPIs, have the same goals that are shared in order to drive towards those same results. Because then it's very easy to agree on the definition that what is a good lead, yeah. what is actually the end result that we are try trying to do with this specific campaign or, you know, advertisement campaign or even a physical event. Yeah. What about the other ways to, let's say, drive traffic? Well, uh, obviously, I already mentioned that Google Ads is one of the one of the bigger ways for us. But uh, something that has uh, keyword been... ads or display keyword, yeah, yeah. keyword, oh, obvi Def obviously, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and that, that's kind of, kind of a way to um, jump the line when you we are not performing SEO. -wise. Exactly, that's what we do in new markets that, yeah. or or you know younger markets for us that we haven't had someone focusing on the content marketing side for long. Then obviously we try to sort of jump the line a little bit in order to be visible, be somewhere visible on Google. And it's actually quite nicely working operation in a way that you drive towards the same goal, whether it's SEM or SEO, but then it's just the better you are at SEO, the less money you need to spend on the ad site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about the other um, other paid? Uh, well, basically, we're well, utilizing uh, well, I already mentioned the SEO, SEM. Uh, we're doing also some promotion on the social channels, but uh, personally, I would really like us to go more into the motion that we use money for uh, new customer acquisition only when we already have enough data that we know that these are specific customers that we want and should be going after. Okay. What we're utilizing for that is that we have a built-in ICP scoring system in our CRM that we use external data, compare our existing sales data, and every time a new company comes in, it gets a scoring. So at least even if we don't know the company, by data we can actually identify that if this is, you know, have we been successful in sales with the similar type of companies previously. Yeah. So that also gives you a sort of, even if you don't know the company, but the data actually says that, you know, this might be a good idea, this might not be a good idea. At least you have some criteria to yeah. work upon in that sense. Uh, do you do any, uh, let's say, account-based marketing kind yes. of operation? Yes, we do. And, and also that is, uh, let's say that depends on the definition of ABM as always. That's one of the acronyms that the yeah. whole 
marketing sounds, world sounds fights much about. Than it is. Right, right. Because a lot of times what we're, what you're talking about is that you are actually just doing targeted marketing for specific companies. There might be few of them. There might be some tens of them or hundred of them, yeah. depending. But uh, but yes, uh, especially what we've been doing that to some extent for a couple of years, and now I think we are moving more towards the motion that we are going to pick very selected strategic customers and plan it a bit more long term than we have done previously. Yeah. Because something that I've also learned is that uh, I, I talk with a sales director from, S, I think it was SAP or Workday back in the day. And I think the discussion with him was brilliant because he explained it to me uh, that, you know, his experiences of ABM is that it works really well in their business. But the salesperson needs to have the desire to get ABM to help him. It okay. needs to be a process that is led by the salesperson because at the end of the day, they are the ones who know the strategy on how are we going to win this account? What are, are the value props that we are actually yeah. going to yeah. go with? What are the pains that we want to address? And if that message is not constant, despite what's th what the touch point the customer has with you, then the whole thing falls apart. And uh, unfortunately, I've been part of many ABM campaigns that start when we have already sent out an offer and then for the next couple of weeks we want to you know have the maximum exposure okay it's better than nothing yeah that's okay but then when we this comes back to the like is that actually abm that yeah. we were doing or yeah, was yeah. it just desperate targeted marketing <laughs> But again, you mentioned uh, one important point is, uh, that um, the marketing and uh, sales, the handover. Yeah. Uh, or I wouldn't even call it a handover because it's not a handover in, uh, in, a, uh, in a way that uh, marketing stops. There, right. Right. Uh, rather that uh, the role uh, stops. Uh, First is marketing guided operation, and then it's sales mm. guided, but the marketing will continue after yeah. that. And and also the sales can handle back the gui uh, guidance to the marketing. Right. So right. Uh, depending on how the case is going on. And and quite typical is that marketing is providing leads and the sales is dropping them on the floor. And Classic. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> and that also comes that, you know, Back to what I mentioned earlier, the number one thing to fix is the process. And that's if, if you have a process in place, but the leads are dropping on the floor, then, you know, either either there's a breakdown in communication or you have not agreed to the definitions of what are we actually doing? What is the, you know, how does the process go step by step? What are the roles, yeah. sort of internal SLAs? And, in, and, and not just the process, also uh, the messaging right. needs to be, the narrative needs to go through the sales. Yes. Uh, um, seeming, uh, without any seams. Right. Because otherwise there's a disconnect. Right. right. And, and the sales thinks that, okay, this is, I, I cannot continue from the, this angle. Right. Or I don't want to continue from, right. from this angle. Right. That is, that is very true and that also comes down to whether you have an SDR team or not. That's also something that you really need to consider and think about that, you know, should it be operating in a way that, for example, SDR takes the first meeting, then documents that, hands it over to the sales executive and they take it forward the best they see. Or maybe do you have a joint second meeting where yeah. actually you have both parties present and then also there's a chance for both parties to learn as well, give feedback. Yeah. What other uh, operations you mentioned, events? Yeah, uh, well, let's say that uh, <laughs> back in the day when I joined the company, I did a math that how much did one contact in our CRM from events cost us the previous year? Take a guess. A thousand? We're not talking about lead, we're talking about a contact. Okay. 1,000 is your guess. Yeah. Roughly 1,900. That was the number that we had back in the day. And uh, I think that's also, if I would be brutally honest, the trend that I'm seeing when setting up a sales organization is that uh, the more you are worried about the competition and put your focus in there, 
and the more you're desperate to go to random sales events in terms of leads, the more immature is your sales organization and the process itself. Yeah. At least the trend that we're seeing internally is that whenever the sales teams get their shit together, they have processes in place, things are up and running, then the events that they want to go to are very selective and strategic ones instead yeah. of just, you know, going to a random event and hoping for miracles. And, and probably they are doing it uh, year after year. So yes. kind, of, kind of you build up the presence yes. and yes, not just exactly. going there and, and not knowing how, how to place yourself in that right. event and right. how, how to get the audience and so exactly. forth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's that's definitely and and also uh, I'm I would argue that uh, whenever going to an event, it, you should approach it exactly the same way as you approach any sales or marketing campaign. That you have a clear agreed goal in mind. Are we here to build brand brand presence? Are we here to meet existing customers mm -hmm. and build the relationships there, or are we actually hunting for new leads? Yeah, and then you measure the success depending on those metrics as well. And uh, in my mind, there should be no difference whether it's a physical event or a webinar or whatever type of activity yeah. you're doing. Of course, same, of course, same uh, rules apply. Yeah. Of course, in the, if it's self-organized um, webinar or, or right. uh, so forth, you are driving the traffic there. Right, right. Whereas if you go to a trade show, you you kind of pay to get access to the traffic right, that's happening Right, but there. I think that... The classic example is that uh, a lot of times what I mentioned about this maturity level of the uh, of the sales teams, what you, the trend that I saw in many countries is that when the sales team doesn't really have a process and cadences and way of working in place that it would be structured, uh, a lot of times you saw them participating in EV charging events. Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean, yeah, relevant industry players were there. Who are we talking with? Our competitors and other industry players. Yeah. Why wouldn't we rather go to an event where our customers are? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like hotel events. Exactly. Or <laughs> exactly. Or you <laughs> know, construction companies, real estate, yeah. gas stations. Yeah, yeah. Of course, some of your people needs to go to the EV events. Right. So always, but but they are not necessarily for for. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And and then also you, this comes back to the fact that you need to know like why are you there? What is the what is the goal yeah. of you you being there? What are the things that you want to be measured upon if you actually made the trip there? We are kind of covered the things, mm. not necessarily in in any particular order, but <laughs> we kind of cover the ground. But uh, what are the inspiration source? How, how do you keep your, how do you improve your craft? Uh, well, I, I read quite a lot, usually from online sources to the things that I run into. I don't have uh, specific people or persons that I would follow. And I also really, really um, like to try to widen the spread spectrum of my thinking in a way that for example the reason that i joined virta was that i wanted to be more involved in sales yeah. i wanted to be you know not purely on the marketing side i wanted to be more on the sales side and learn from that but uh i would say that the inspiration sources uh a lot of times when you see companies doing something that really opens up your eyes in, in ways of like, okay, they have actually built this and made it to something that works. To me, that is much more inspirational than, uh, you know, a specific TED talk or a sales coach or a marketing coach yeah. that LinkedIn is full of. And uh, especially with, with a lot of people preaching other people on how to do things. And also I have been one of them myself when I was working as a consultant. Uh, a lot of times I faced the situation that they may have not... Uh, walk the walk themselves yeah and then uh and of course we have two kind of kinds of gu gurus we have those who tell that okay uh you should do this right and this is a one size fits all kind right. of approach right and then we have those consultants it depends yeah every every answer begins from it depends right. and after half an hour you still don't know what they are going to right suggest right so <laughs> <laughs> try to navigate those. Yeah, but actually, now now that you asked about inspirations, I think one of the mm, most influential books, at least for my thinking, what I have read and what I think, like, uh, even though it talks about uh, OKR methodology, but I think there was a lot of lot of other good things when you think about the 
uh, especially in the digital marketing and sales world, how you need to kind of like set the goals that go to the same direction and then the process kind of like finds its way there automatically. Okay. And I'm talking about measure what matters. Okay. And, yeah. I, and I think that has an, had a big impact on the way of my thinking and the way that I want to be running my teams too. Because I, I, I really like the book itself and uh, the methodology itself obviously works. But then I think it has a, it's not only the methodology, but it's also, you know, we are in a competitive environment, always operating with limited resources. We need to always understand internally what are we trying to do? What is the number that's going to change if we take part in this project? What is what are we actually trying to achieve by taking part in this event? Yeah. And it, unless those goals are aligned across the teams that are part of the whole exercise, then sooner or, la sooner or later you're going to go to a wrong direction there. Yeah. So I, th I think that has a, you know, even though it talks about the specific methodology, but I think there's a lot that can be applied into running a team being a team leader, talking with the individuals and uh, also the di uh, digital and technological processes as well. I have that book. I haven't read it yet. I've had Please. to move it on top of the... You probably should. Uh, <laughs> top, top of the list. Uh, one note here is that thinking when you're talking about uh, gurus and say marketing right. inspirational sources and, and, and uh, kind of there are two different approaches you as an agency player like you used mm. to be uh you need to be very good on on the craft itself right. but as a director you need to be good on leading mm. the process you don't need to be that good on on the actual Detail marketing stuff. stuff right right i mean uh your challenges are probably much more uh, uh leading problems yeah. How, how do you get the uh, the organization do the things that you want them to do? Whereas in agency business, uh, you are advising the customer, and the customer is not doing what you are advising. Right. So you're. But you, but you, you, you kind of have the leadership problem, but you don't have. Right. It. Right. Yeah. I think. I think overall, uh, personally, I think I'm very hands on when it comes to stuff. I help people build dashboards. I dig into the yeah, different technological stuff and try to find ways because uh, I think deep down I'm very lazy and I love to automate stuff. Yeah. And then if I can help someone else's daily work that I automated something for them, it makes me feel good. And I yeah. think this is overall something that uh, even though uh, I have a couple of teams that uh, are reporting to me, but I don't want to lose that part of my job where I can actually spend a few hours per week that I dig into something, maybe learn something new, and then I'm able to make someone else's yeah. life a little bit easier yeah. or our process more uh, more fluent or maybe get two different pieces of software to talk together and all of a sudden we have a better view of the customer itself. Uh, so I think uh, personally, I, I luckily have not lost the whole hands-on part of things and uh, not the little uh, the little geek in me is still mm. quite happy about it and i think that really helps that even though i might not be you know listening to the sdr sales calls on a daily basis yeah. like what they actually discuss about but when i look at the overall process how things are moving i can quite easily identify from data if some stuff is not happening uh, that should be happening and uh, then obviously go from there and and discuss those things what may be the reasons behind it and uh, oftentimes what i uh, what is a big part of my work as well is to sort of make sure that we run the same process in each geo as yeah. we speak. And that's also something that it's not only me leading my team, it's actually me leading sideways our geo directors. Yeah. And, uh, and also the more, the more responsibility you get in the company, the more the internal sales of different things becomes actually a daily part of your job. Like I said, yeah, a ton of your work is actually leading nowadays, yeah. whereas in agency business, but much more in the doing side. Yeah, 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 that is true. And and also, obviously, you know, in a growth company, uh, the challenges are endless. Uh, yeah, we yeah. Often, often discuss about it with a lot of colleagues that were always in the middle of a constant chaos. And uh, that that actually is true when you are in a company that grows very fast. Sometimes the, you know, 
we start steering the ship this way and the next week we're actually going to the opposite direction and you just need to be able to deal with it and not just completely go crazy when things like that happen. And uh, I think also a lot of the challenges that comes from from the leadership aspects, uh, if you think about throughout the past few years, uh, I think at the very core of it, you cannot emphasize the import- importance of recruiting the right people enough. Mm. And and that that always is a, it's not an easy easy matter, and it, it can be something that eventually. You know, it bites you back a couple of years after you actually have done the decision. Yeah. It doesn't doesn't go well. And then also, especially when you have the pressure of the high growth, and then all of a sudden there might be a lot of headcount growth as well, then how do you actually find the balance between, you know, the recruitment side of things? Because you do need to be involved in it to actually make sure that things go the way they should. But then also that always comes on top of everything else that your daily calendar is already filled with. Yeah, and then... And on those times of the day and, and where you not necessarily want them. Yeah. Because the recruiting happens right. in unplannable right. Say, right. Exactly. schedule. Exactly. But, uh, but I think like overall, uh, when you think about the very core of the leadership, at least uh, I believe that the, what people want from their leader is structure and direction. Yeah. And... Uh, at the end of the day, if you can provide those things and then obviously when you work in a, uh, that you have a lot of people above you and you have some teams that actually report to you, you're always going to be a little bit caught in between. And uh, that requires internal sales. Sometimes they go upwards, sometimes they go downwards. But at the end of the day, if you can provide, you know, clarity, structure and direction to your team, that's what usually is a very good way to motivate people as well. You mentioned one trait that you are lazy, mm. and and uh, laziness is often considered as a bad trait. Right. Although um, Bill Gates has been um, quoted saying that uh, he prefers to hire lazy people because they find uh, they they find uh, solutions. Right. Uh, they uh, automate stuff, yeah, and and uh, to because they are lazy, and, and I prefer to think the same. Me also being lazy. If if you're if you're not lazy, you are willing to do ton of stuff day after day after day, right? Uh, whereas if you're lazy, you try to find ways to automate. You try to find ways to create processes. Right. You try to find ways to code systems or right. whatever to do. Right. You're much more innovative in that yeah. sense. I fully agree. And, uh, and oftentimes what I witness is that people are too busy with their daily tasks to take one step back and focus on the more important matters. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, people are too busy to spend one day of automating a task that they spend four hours per day to do. Yeah. So let's try to close this up. Uh, for our young listeners, mm who are thinking of uh, their career choi- choices, what advices would you give to your, yourself if you're starting as a 20-year-old self again? Would you choose the craft again? Or uh, well, I think like would you make uh, different uh, choices regarding what kind of companies you would like to work with? Uh, in, in, yeah, in the beginning, I think I think overall, uh, if I think about my sort of career path so far, and I think about twenty-year-old myself, I think one of the most important skills in uh, today's work environment is to be able to learn new things quickly and adapt quickly, because things are changing at a rapid pace. Uh, you know, my job did not exist fifteen years ago, yeah. and. Uh, if I think about the twenty-year-old myself, I would, I would have probably give a tip that uh, I should be very focused on what is it that I actually want to do as a job, instead of what is it that I actually want to study. Because to me, at least, those seem to be two little bit of a different things. Yeah, what yeah. is fun to study might lead to uh, a profession that is not actually something that tickles your brains the same way. But uh, if, if I would think about like from the general perspective, I would really, really look into 
looking for a different type of training opportunities, what actually it is that, you know, what gives you the thrive that in, in the morning when you get out of bed, what makes you get out of bed, what is it the thing that actually, you know, you get this little tickling sensation that now now we're actually doing something that matters to me as well. And uh, I would spend, spend some time thinking about it and then also uh, not necessarily care that much about the salary at that point because it's much, much more valuable to understand what is it that you want to do at that point when you, when you actually enter the job market and uh, are looking for an actual job, your first job that you want to do. I had no clue. I probably had no clue still when I was 27. And and you would select the same route again, uh, kind of, or, or at the same target. Yeah, yeah, hard, hard to say. It was kind of, uh, first I, uh, I studied media and communications, and then a lot of people from there were actually working either as a researchers or journalists. Yeah. Then from there I went to work as a, I think I was like a communications manager or a communication specialist, which was my first actual job that was somehow related yeah. to communications or marketing. I come back from my summer holiday and we have these new cards on our table and all of a sudden it says marketing. So I was like, ah, okay, hint taken. <laughs> yeah. so, so that was the switch from there. Then it kind of naturally evolved on my side more towards the digital side of things because that was what I was more interested about and and also that seemed much much more relevant and effective at that time and then from there it kind of like has been evolving naturally and then nowadays much more towards sales so I don't know if that can be that's I don't know if that is a traditional path or what type of path it is has worked for me but uh there has been no one really guiding the way and uh for some people, that could be an important thing as well. I would categorize uh, this as a growth wizardy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what I'm meaning is that it, it doesn't matter what the actual skill sets mm. are, whether you're more sales focused or you're more, let's say, marketing focused or right. content focused or paid ad focused or whatever right. but you need to be kind of generalist yeah uh, uh, and anyway the big opportunity for these kind of crowd wizards comes from uh, taking uh, startups to the world mm. uh, these kind of positions didn't exist right. 10 years ago right because we didn't have those companies yeah and and nowadays people like you are making their careers with the, uh, what I haven't seen much in Finland is that we have those guys as a founder team members mm. making uh, unicorns right but after a while we tend to see those happening mm. in different uh, other markets where we, we, we can see that okay the guys who in Silicon Valley have been in a couple of uh, startups in in growth roles are now uh, founder uh, co-founders of are being uh, recruited as a uh, first five employee right with right. Uh, with big st uh, big stock options and big big uh, uh, slices of the companies in the beginning they are making millions tens millions hundreds of millions right and and think about for example the the, the whole pay pal mafia mm. what's happening now right right it kind of Everybody is somewhere. Yeah. Doing, so someone found it LinkedIn, and the other found it uh, right. uh, Tesla, and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, Ma makes total sense. And I think overall, uh, one of the things that uh, it's not necessarily something that I would say to twenty-year-old myself or to any twenty-year-old, but what I'd like to say to a lot of marketers is that you're going to be incredibly more valuable if you study sales. Yeah, yeah. try to understand the sales process, how it actually works and get as close to it as possible, you know, take part in customer meetings. And uh, I, I think that's still sort of the distinction that I see, not only coming from the companies themselves, but actually marketers themselves. That but they not necessarily uh, selecting sales as a carrier. Right. Because sales carrier is still, you can do that much sales right. yourself. Right. 
uh, and your values based on how much sales you can make. Right. But if you are a growth, vi a growth wizard, yeah, you need to uh, understand. You the sales you, you part. can raise a company from one million to hundred million and hundred million to billion and, and right. so forth. Uh, then you're a rainmaker. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Ob obviously, your value to the team is t totally different. Right. But then you're a founder level guy, right? And not someone who is going to be hired yeah, from yeah. outside. But you need several positions to graduate to there. Yeah. Unless you get really lucky <laughs> and 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 hang up with the guys in the startup community and and. Join the startup as a 20-year-old uh, yeah. yourself, and you make it big, and yeah. everybody <laughs> considers you as a as a rainmaker, even though you know, didn't know what you were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that happens too, and good for them. But uh, but yeah, I think I think like overall, like when you mentioned the word growth, I think a lot of times, especially well, not necessarily that much anymore. But if we go if we go a few years back, I think a lot of uh, companies in Finland were thinking growth as something that if we hire just one marketer and we do a great job in recruitment, yeah. they're going to turn things overnight to something else and all of a sudden we're going to be global and every, everyone's going to be talking about it instead of thinking it as a long-term investment. And the, and the problem with that approach is that when you're selecting in a marketer or a marketing agency, mm. if you're selecting a marketer, you are basically selecting someone who is probably having a say old skill set, right? A quite limited skill set, mostly on the management side of right. things, rather than on a creative or, yeah. or or growth side of things. And if you are hiring agency, you are probably hiring someone who is specialist in one or two things, right? Meaning that you are not actually you, you, when you are selecting an agency, you are actually selecting your strategy. Right. But you didn't make that choice. Right. Right. And that, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is true. And overall, uh, like the idea of of having a clear strategy and then having your marketing sort of, you know, having obviously your marketing strategy aligned to that, but considering the whole company as an sort of like the you know, growth engine, everything is interlinked and these different departments need to work with one another in order for the for the whole equation to work. And I think that is something that, especially in Finland, we are still way, way behind. Yeah. This is a good place to start, uh, end this all. And to summarize it, this kind of a, let's say, the growth wizard is a m multi talent <laughs> talent uh, show you, uh, or our sport you need to be good on so many things yeah. uh, it's not a CEO it's not uh, paid it's uh, it's not uh, sales it's everything it's messaging it's yeah I think I think if I would th speak from my own perspective uh, or you know from what I've seen during the past few years, it's not that you come up with some very creative, you know, groundbreaking idea. It's much more having the structure to do the long term work and put pieces together, find what works for you and then optimize from there. That has been our approach. When in doubt, simplify. Yeah. And that that really has been the, you know, having the structure in place that we actually can prove that works then build upon that foundation piece by piece, test something new, see if it works. If it does, good, keep it in the portfolio. If it doesn't, well, then do something else. But um, we haven't ever really expected anything to happen overnight. Always when we hire uh, a new marketer in some geos, I talk with the geo leader and I make sure that they understand that you're not going to see a single difference in the result within the first six months. Don't expect that. That's not going to happen. Then we see actually 12 months from now that we are starting to rank better in Google. Our website might be more to the local tone than what you have been asking for for the past couple of years. And then we're actually going to see, you know, a stable growth from there. And that's why we are hiring this marketing person here. We are not finding, we're not trying to hire someone who's going to turn over things overnight because that just doesn't happen. Yeah, that's, uh, those creative things are obviously interesting to read from mm. Ogilvy's books or whatever it might be or hear the ad agency stories right. but this uh, seldom yeah 
that kind of stuff. Yeah. So lead a lot, a ton of leadership management right. kind of things. Right, tying processes together, making sure that everything's aligned towards the same goal. And uh, quite basic stuff. System, building processes, building systems, right. uh, problem solving, yeah. um, and handling ton of different kind of sports in yeah. it. In it. Yeah. So and you kind of need to know everything at least in a superficial level, like they said in growth hacking, you need to need to know the basics of almost everything, right. and then you are really good on something. Yeah, yeah, and also, also I think that uh, when you think about, you know, the whole spectrum of things. Besides that, that uh, like for example, we are doing a variety of different things around content. But at the end of the day, it very much comes down to that the better you know your customer, or at least once you know your customer, yeah. the better your direction is going to be. Just the one who understands what the customer wants content-wise is usually the winner yeah. in exactly. almost all the, all of the things, exactly. whether you are paid at all or SEO or whatever. Right, and then when you actually are able to identify those patterns that, okay, we have this set of customer that is actually trying to solve this problem yeah. through us. Maybe we should address that problem in the content. How do we educate them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Samuli. And you can be followed in LinkedIn. Yeah, um, um, at least can be found on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, those channels at least. So yeah. not a, if, uh, you know, not, not going to be like a treasure hunt to find me from there. So feel free to follow. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Samuel. This was an uh, absolute pleasure. I have at least learned a lot. I hope Thank the so uh, listeners also uh, learned a lot. And <laughs> I hope that we hear a uh, ton of other $100 million uh, Finnish startup stories uh, <laughs> in coming, coming years. Unfortunately, we don't have too many of those in the same caliber, most of the Fingers companies crossed there would be more to come in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all the listeners and until next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.